From the very first day I moved into the quiet neighborhood of Maplewood, something about the house next to mine gave me an uneasy feeling. It was a quaint two-story building, similar to mine, but perpetually shrouded in a sense of neglect. The lawn was overgrown and the curtains were always drawn, but what really unsettled me was the constant eerie silence that surrounded it. I never saw anyone enter or leave. My curiosity got the better of me one evening, when I saw a faint light flickering in the upstairs window. It was the first sign of life I'd noticed since moving in. I decided to introduce myself to my neighbor, hoping to ease the growing tension I felt every time I glanced at the house. As I approached the door, a chill ran down my spine. The air felt heavier, and an inexplicable sense of dread washed over me. I knocked, but there was no answer. Just as I was about to turn away, the door creaked open ever so slightly. Hello, I called out, peeking inside. The house was dark, save for a dim light coming from the back room. I stepped inside, driven by a mix of concern and curiosity. The interior was as neglected as the exterior. Dust covered everything, and the air was stale. I followed the light to the back room, where I found a small, decrepit TV flickering with static. Suddenly, I heard a creaking sound upstairs. My heart pounded in my chest. Hello? Is anyone there? I called out again, my voice barely a whisper. No response. I cautiously made my way upstairs, each step groaning under my weight. The hallway was lined with old family photos, their faces scratched out, adding to the growing fear inside me. That's when I heard it, a low, guttural moaning coming from one of the rooms. I hesitated, every instinct telling me to run, but I pushed the door open. The room was in complete darkness except for a small candle burning in the corner. And there, in the flickering light, was an old man, his back to me, rocking slowly in an armchair. Sir, are you all right? I asked tentatively. He didn't respond, just kept rocking. Then, without warning, he stopped and turned his head towards me. His eyes were hollow, his face gaunt and pale. He opened his mouth, but instead of words, a horrifying scream filled the room. I stumbled back, crashing into the hallway wall. The photos were no longer scratched out. Instead, their eyes were all staring directly at me, full of malice and accusation. I ran, tripping down the stairs and out of the house, never looking back, I could still hear the old man's scream echoing in my ears. The next day, I gathered my courage and went to the local library to research the house. What I found chilled me to the bone. The house had been empty for years, ever since the tragic death of the family that lived there. They were murdered inexplicably by the father, who was found rocking in his armchair, completely catatonic. I couldn't sleep after that. Every night, I would hear the faint sound of an armchair rocking from next door, and I knew I wasn't imagining it. I moved out a week later. I couldn't stand the oppressive atmosphere, the feeling of being watched, the unending sorrow that seemed to emanate from that house. To this day, I still don't know what I saw that night. Was it the ghost of the old man, trapped in his own horrific past, or something far more sinister? All I know is that the memory of that night the screaming and the accusing eyes in the photos will haunt me forever. Once in a small, unassuming neighborhood, there lived a man named David. David was a quiet, solitary individual who enjoyed the simple things in life. A good book, a cup of coffee in the morning, and the peacefulness of his small house. Everything was ordinary until the house next door was sold. The new neighbor, whom David barely saw, moved in silently. There were no moving trucks, no welcoming committee, just the subtle change of ownership. At first, David thought little of it. Everyone has their peculiarities, he reasoned. But soon, things began to feel off. It started with the noises. Late at night, David would hear strange sounds emanating from next door. They weren't the typical sounds of a household. These were unsettling, scratching, thumping, and occasionally a muffled cry. 
David tried to convince himself it was just the new neighbor settling in, but the noises became more frequent and more disturbing. Then there were the shadows. David would often see fleeting shadows pass by his neighbor's windows. They were too quick to make out clearly, but they didn't seem human. More than once, he caught a glimpse of something peering out from behind the curtains, only to vanish when he looked directly at it. David's curiosity eventually overcame his apprehension. One evening, he decided to introduce himself to his mysterious neighbor. As he approached the door, a chill ran down his spine. The house seemed to loom over him, its windows like dark, watching eyes. He knocked. The door creaked open slowly, revealing a dimly lit hallway. But there was no one there to greet him. Hesitantly, David stepped inside, calling out a tentative, Hello? The inside of the house was cold, and the air was thick with a musty odor. As David ventured further, he noticed that the walls seemed to be covered in what looked like old newspaper clippings, all featuring various missing persons reports. A sudden noise upstairs startled him. It sounded like a whimper. Driven by a mixture of fear and concern, David ascended the stairs. The upper floor was in disarray, with doors ajar and a faint light spilling from one of the rooms. Approaching the lit room, David's heart pounded in his chest. The door was slightly open, and he could hear a faint, ragged breathing. Pushing the door further, he stepped inside and froze. There, in the middle of the room, was a figure hunched over something on the floor. It was his neighbor, but this person, this thing, didn't seem human. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and it was making a guttural sound that chilled David to the bone. On the floor lay a person, bound and gagged, eyes wide with terror. It was a face David recognized from one of the missing person's clippings. Adrenaline surged through him. He needed to act, and fast. Without thinking, David lunged at the creature, tackling it to the ground. A struggle ensued, the creature emitting horrifying shrieks. In the chaos, David managed to free the captive, urging them to escape. The police arrived soon after, alerted by the freed victim. They found David in the house, shaken but alive. The creature, however, had vanished, leaving no trace behind except the disturbing evidence of its presence. In the aftermath, the neighborhood was never the same. The house next door stood empty, a constant reminder of the horror that had lurked within. David couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched, and the memories of that night haunted him. He eventually moved away, seeking peace in a new place. But the story of the disturbing neighbor spread, a true horror story that reminded everyone that sometimes the most terrifying monsters are those that live right next door. I never believed in the supernatural, not until I moved into 45 Redwood Drive. The house was a steel, old but with character, nestled in a quiet suburb. My neighbors seemed friendly, except for the house to my left. Number 47, an aging, decrepit structure, seemed to loom ominously, its windows like dark, unblinking eyes. The first oddity occurred a week after I moved in. It was a subtle thing, a low murmur coming from the walls. I assumed it was the pipes or maybe a quirk of the old building. But it persisted, a constant, unintelligible whisper that seemed to follow me from room to room. I met my neighbor from number 47 at a community gathering. He was an elderly man, Mr. Harrow, with a gaunt face and piercing eyes. His handshake was cold, his grip too firm. Keep an ear out, he whispered cryptically as he left his words sending a shiver down my spine. The whispers grew louder. I could hear them at night, a symphony of hushed voices that seemed to be conversing with each other. I couldn't make out any words, but the tone was unmistakable, urgent, almost pleading. I told myself I was imagining things, a result of the stress from the move. Two weeks in, I discovered an old diary hidden beneath the floorboards in my bedroom. It belonged to a young girl who used to live in my house decades ago. Her entries started innocuously, detailing her life and family. 
But as I read on, her words grew darker. She wrote about the whispers, about how they promised her things, whispered secrets about the people around her. She mentioned Mr. Harrow often, describing him as a strange man with shadows in his eyes. Her final entry was a scrawled warning. Don't listen to the walls. They lie. That night, the whispers grew frantic. I could hear them clearly for the first time. They spoke of hidden things, of dark secrets buried beneath the house. They promised knowledge, power. If only I would listen closer, I decided to confront Mr. Harrow. When I knocked on his door, the air felt charged, heavy with unspoken words. He greeted me with that same unsettling stare. I asked him about the whispers, the girl, the diary. His reaction was visceral. His eyes widened, and for a moment, I saw fear in them. You must leave, he hissed. The house is cursed. It feeds on curiosity, on those who listen. I tried to warn you. I left, shaken, but more determined than ever to uncover the truth. That night, I sat in my room, listening to the whispers. They were seductive, promising to unveil the mysteries of the world. Days blurred into nights. I stopped going out, stopped answering calls. The whispers were all that mattered. They told me of ancient rituals, of ways to harness power from beyond the veil. I started seeing things, shadows, moving in the corner of my eye, figures standing just beyond the reach of light. The house felt alive, pulsating with a malevolent energy. Then, one night, everything changed. The whispers grew into a cacophonous roar, urging me to go to the basement. I found myself standing before a wall, the voices imploring me to break it down. Behind the wall, I discovered a room, old and musty. In the center was a circle, drawn with symbols I didn't recognize. The air was thick with a sense of wrongness, of a ritual interrupted. The whispers were ecstatic, urging me to complete what had been started. But in that moment, clarity struck me. This was madness. The room, the circle, the whispers. They were all part of a malevolent force that had consumed the girl, that was now trying to consume me. I fled the house, driving until I reached the safety of daylight. I reported everything to the authorities, but when they investigated, they found nothing. No hidden room, no circle, just an ordinary basement. I never returned to 45 Redwood Drive. Mr. Harrow disappeared soon after, leaving behind more questions than answers. To this day, I wonder about the house, about the whispers. Were they a figment of my imagination or something far more sinister? I suppose some mysteries are better left unsolved, but sometimes in the stillness of night, I swear I can hear a faint whisper calling me back to that house to uncover the truth hidden within its walls. In the quiet suburbs of my hometown, where the only disturbance used to be the chirping of birds at dawn, I encountered a horror that still sends shivers down my spine. This is my true account of the disturbing neighbor who turned my life into a living nightmare. It all started when Mr. Thompson moved in next door. An elderly man, he had a peculiar aura about him, always dressed in outdated, ragged clothes and seldom seen outside during the day. His arrival was shrouded in mystery. No one knew where he came from or why he chose our neighborhood. Initially, I thought nothing of it. After all, everyone deserves their privacy. The first sign that something was amiss was the odd noises that began to emanate from his house late at night. They weren't loud, but they were distinct. A kind of scraping, like metal against wood, accompanied by faint, indistinct mutterings. I tried to brush it off as the ramblings of an old man, but the noises became a nightly occurrence, disrupting my sleep and leaving me on edge. Curiosity eventually got the better of me, and one evening I decided to peek through the fence that separated our yards. What I saw chilled me to the bone. Mr. Thompson was digging a large hole in his backyard under the cover of darkness. The sight of an old man digging at night was unsettling enough, but what truly frightened me was the way he kept glancing around as if making sure no one was watching. I retreated to my house, 
my mind racing with possibilities. Perhaps he was just gardening, but at night. And why did he seem so secretive? I decided to keep an eye on him, hoping to quell my growing fears. A few days later, the situation escalated. I woke up in the middle of the night to find Mr. Thompson standing in my backyard, staring into my bedroom window. I was paralyzed with fear. When I finally mustered the courage to shout, he simply turned and walked away, disappearing into the shadows. I called the police, but they found nothing amiss and suggested he was just a harmless old man. But things only got worse. Pets in the neighborhood began to disappear, and sometimes I'd find strange, unidentifiable marks on my lawn, as if something or someone had been dragged across it. The scraping noises from Mr. Thompson's house grew louder, more frantic, and his nocturnal activities in his backyard continued. One night, driven by a mix of fear and determination, I decided to confront Mr. Thompson. Armed with a flashlight, I went over to his house. The door was ajar, which struck me as odd. As I pushed it open, the stench hit me. A foul, rotting smell that made my stomach churn. The inside of his house was a maze of clutter and filth, but it was what I found in his living room that haunts me to this day. Newspaper clippings covered the walls, each detailing various unsolved disappearances from over the years. In the middle of the room, surrounded by candles, was a large, dirt-stained sack. I didn't need to open it to know what was inside. I stumbled back, horrified, and ran out of the house. I called the police, my voice trembling as I tried to explain what I had seen. The police arrived and what they uncovered was more horrifying than I could have imagined. The sack in Mr. Thompson's living room contained human remains, and the hole in his backyard was a makeshift grave, containing the bodies of several missing persons from over the years. Mr. Thompson was nowhere to be found. He had vanished into the night. The neighborhood was never the same after that. People moved away, and those who stayed were forever haunted by the horrors that had occurred right next door. As for me, I'm left with unending questions and a fear that one day Mr. Thompson might return. To this day, the scraping noises and the sight of that old man digging in the dead of night invade my dreams, turning them into nightmares. The horror of the disturbing neighbor, the true face of evil revealed in the most ordinary of places, serves as a chilling reminder that sometimes the most terrifying stories are the ones that happen right next door.